excited about what the Lord is doing. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're coming into a place in the church. I remember speaking in prayer many years ago. It was normal church until it wasn't. It was sort of just, we were used to how it went and how Sunday service went and how Sunday night and how Wednesday night and how Saturday night. And it was just, it was just the routine. It was regular until all of a sudden, in a moment, the Lord began to change some things, began to change some atmospheres. That is exactly what the Lord is going to do in this house today. He's going to change some atmospheres in this house. And we thank God for that. And so what we're going to do, just before I begin, we're just going to reach out to the Lord. And if, if you don't have liberty in your spirit, what does liberty look like? Liberty looks like Suzanne Castell in the back, jumping and shouting. Looks like Brother Jonathan. You don't even know. It's not your church. You go to Bible college, but he comes in here, and it's like he just feels at home because the presence of the Lord is here. And so he can just worship with reckless abandon. It's like Brother Caleb getting in my personal bubble during worship service. Hallelujah. But God wants to change your atmosphere today. He wants to change how you look at the kingdom of God and how you worship and how you speak, how you think. And so we're just going to pray for a few moments and just raise a hand up to heaven. Jesus, we love you in this house. You're great and greatly to be praised. Uh, hallelujah. And we come expecting you, Lord, are going to do a sovereign work amongst your people, Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to do a mighty act, Lord. You're going to change some atmospheres in this house and we give you praise and honor Lord we love and desire you hallelujah I want to tell you about how powerful it is when people praise I want to I've been in Pentecost long enough to know how how we do things and I want to tell you I'm, I'm going to tell you it's the secrets of Pentecost today all the juicy little tidbits that you don't get you know how Pentecostals praise when the pastor says praise? We praise the Lord for about 15 to 20 seconds. And that's it. And then there's a shift and you go, okay, we're done. And then we're done. And then we go back to whatever else we want to do. But I had a glimpse of an atmosphere change in prayer last night. When Jenny said, great job, ladies. Jenny and Joe, they're not even here, but great job, ladies. In prayer last night, Jody's back there, okay. Where Jenny, who doesn't even like public speaking, begins to lead us in corporate prayer, and she comes in. <laughs> she says, can we just start by praising the Lord? It was, was no loud Josh Rezar, you need to praise the Lord. That well, was just little Jenny. Can we just praise the Lord? And for over two minutes, that whole room just erupted in praise and it came in waves. There was an atmosphere change where it wasn't like I have to do my Pentecostal catechism and just praise just enough. So the pastor won't, will think I'm okay. There was just an atmosphere where people said, I just, I just feel like praising the Lord. That is the atmosphere that God is going to change in your life and in this church today. Can I tell you an atmosphere? And I have scripture, don't worry. This comes later. Tony said I had too much scripture today. An atmosphere you create, that you create, always affects the natural around you. A spiritual atmosphere, 
a certain attitude, an atmosphere of forgiveness, an atmosphere of praise, an atmosphere of worship, an atmosphere of prayer. Steve Willoughby writes, he was a missionary to Singapore, I think it was, wasn't it? And uh, he writes, your praise is infectious. He was in the revivals in Ethiopia 30 years ago where over a million souls received the Holy Ghost. He said, I was in these revivals and for three days, these people saw me worship before they ever saw me preach. And for three days, he danced and he praised and he worshiped just like everybody else. And when he stepped behind that pulpit, the people responded because the atmosphere he created was infectious. You ever see folks that uh, they can't lift a hand for nothing, but as soon as they're called to speak about something, they're firecrackers. I always wonder about that. Atmosphere of bitterness. Atmosphere is your creation. My manager, she'll never watch this. I shouldn't say that. She's going to watch this and she's going to get saved. My manager came in the other day to work. She basically said how she was bitter and how she shouldn't have been a manager. I thought, my soul, not good. But in the church house, you create the atmosphere. Sometimes when we come in, this is the problem. We come in, we wait for somebody else to create our atmosphere. So when somebody says something about your kid, or your latest hair outfit. Your hair project. Tyson, you look amazing. I'm just jealous, that's all. I'm just jealous. So we come in with a certain atmosphere of unforgiveness or bitterness or lust or addiction. And I can tell you, there has been times in my life where I, have, where I have come into the church, or even when I'm at home, I just think to myself, I can't even worship. You can't put your finger on it. But you think, I, I just can't even. It's just, I don't feel good, and I just nothing's going right. Anybody ever feel like that? No devil in hell can stop you from worshiping Jesus. The man who they called Legion came and said, I'm worshiping you, Lord. Help me. What you do is you create that. It doesn't matter if you're possessed or not. It doesn't. The possessed Legion of devils in that man, he still went to the Lord. And so when you sit there and go, I'm waiting for the preacher to create my atmosphere. I'm waiting for the music to create my atmosphere so I can... God's good enough to worship just who he is, just what he's already done, just his excellent greatness and his mighty acts and his awesome power and his majesty. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He's power. You create your atmosphere. Oh, see? Hallelujah. See what happens? Hambosha, you're wonderful, you're holy, there's none like you and none besides you. My God is great and greatly to be praised. Oh, the matchless name of Jesus. It's the name above every name. Oh, hallelujah. 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 And you see the atmosphere change right there. You know what was amazing about last Saturday night? There were so many things that were amazing. But what was amazing was the youth president's wife for that particular um, small collection of churches told us after. She said, we could tell who came from your church because they were the ones standing and worshiping. She said, it's infectious. We're just not used to it, but we like it. Your praise is infectious. 
The atmosphere you create in the church is infectious. So when you come into the house, don't wait for somebody else to create your atmosphere. Don't wait and say, well, maybe that third song, like old Ralph Hall used to do, he'd sit for that. I mean, he was like 104, but I love Ralph. But he would sit for the first three songs, and on the right, wasn't it? Or on the third song, he would then stand. Like clockwork for years. That's what he would do. He would not stand for the first two or three songs, and then the last song, he would always stand. What if you just came to church? And you just kept praising all through worship. Oh God, I just can't get enough of how great you are. I can't get enough of how wonderful you are. Oh, you're so mighty. Oh, you're so... Instead of being intoxicated with the world, why don't we get intoxicated with Jesus? Instead of coming for five or ten minutes and doing our little catechisms. I'm getting ahead of myself. I never send Brother Terry Marcus away. He just knows better. Negative people, negative atmosphere. Faith-filled people. Faith-filled atmosphere. And even in my own life, I've been recognizing this. Don't speak negative. Well, the church. Well, the people in the church. Well, this situation. You get what you speak. You don't understand there's a power in what you speak. That's why spontaneously 15 people stood up and began to praise the Lord. Guess what happened? There was a change in the atmosphere, wasn't there? But conversely, when you start trashing things in the kingdom of God, whether it's people, whether it's the church, whether it's leadership, whatever it is, or whether it's just about your own life and your family and your situation, guess what? You speak that into the atmosphere and it's going to happen. You speak negative, that's what you're going to get. But you speak, God's doing it. God's doing it. God's going to do it. Oh, I got faith that God's still in charge and he's on the throne and he's going to do everything he said he was going to. And all of a sudden there's an atmosphere change. But guess who it depended on? Not your neighbor. Woo! trying to pick on somebody but I just want to be careful Ackerman <laughs> just, I love brother Ackerman I just I won't pick on brother Ackerman today hallelujah brother Andrew I'll pick on you brother Andrew he's had a rough go of things in life like a lot of us but when he comes into the church house guess what God, you're still good. He recognizes, he says, "Ah, there's nothing wrong with this. And if I don't keep my focus on that, I can get pulled into everything else. I have been in those seasons of my life where what I really looked forward to was sitting down with somebody and talking about how bad things were. Nobody else. I would sit down and say, oh, well, this isn't working. And well, that person doesn't understand and they don't appreciate me. And, blah, 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 and, and, the, and I would just, but you know what happens after you're done? Emptiness. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no fulfillment. There's, there's no power. You just feel like Meh. there's a weight on you. But God is going to change that for you today. You don't have to leave this place going, nothing's happening. Think people aren't coming to God. My family's not safe. Oh, no. God, you're doing it. Lord, there's so much power running through your church. And I'm so excited about what God is doing amongst his people. Woo! But the atmosphere starts with you. I want to talk today about three atmospheres. Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And I preached on this a few weeks ago about the three pillars of Pentecost or apostolic faith. Is, uh, what was it? Apostolic doctrine, 
apostolic prayer and apostolic fellowship. And the key to unity, a lot of times, is not just 20 minutes at an altar. That doesn't unify. That helps unify the church. But how will they know that we are his disciples? By our love one towards another. How do you love somebody when you won't talk to them? That's tough. How do you love somebody when you won't sit down and have a meal with them? That's really tough. But here's the difference is that sometimes in the church we visit unity on a Sunday. And the Lord's been working me over on this. How do we just stop visiting unity? Because there is a direct connection in the spirit. When you create an atmosphere of unity in your church, when you literally move to 100 Unity Drive and you plant there, you say, this is where I'm living. I'm just not visiting it on a Sunday night when Stoops is here or when Bishop gets up to preach or I'm going to live here on Tuesday afternoon and I'm going to live here on Thursday and I'm going to speak faith about my brother and my sister and what God is doing. When we choose to dwell in unity, there is no telling what God will do. I'm telling you, there is a direct connection between unity and harvest. If you are not unified, you can only get a trickle of the harvest that God desires for this church. But when you endeavor to keep the unity of the faith, when you say, I'm going to be in unity regardless of what's going on around me, and I've talked about this a lot, it was just sledding and food. And I mean, Trevor acted like he was 25 going down the hills. Like a, He went on a GT. And there's my wife going, those kids are not going off that rock. And there's Milty. Oh, yeah, I could do this all day long. And he gets on a GT. <laughs> Goes down, hits the rock. I mean, he's eight feet in the air. Jesus, 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 Jesus. But we were just sledding and goofing off and having fun and being stupid. And then we came over here and ate cake. Ate some more food and being stupid and having fun. But it was unifying. When the people of God get together and let their walls down and just be transparent and real, it creates an atmosphere of unity. And unity creates the necessary gas, if you would, for harvest. No unity, no harvest. No dwelling to prefer your brother over yourself. No harvest. But when you decide, I'm going to be unified no matter what, and I've told you this before, there's going to be no wedge here. Oh, the devil's tried. You think it's easy being in leadership. It's not. Because the enemy will attack you first. The enemy attacks them first. And the enemy knows if they, he can put a wedge in between there. Then he can get into the church. There'll be no division in this leadership. Because we're going to be unified. The second atmosphere that you need to think on. Psalm 16 and 11. That will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. and thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And I heard a preacher preach about this and it just illuminated this word to me. And what I'm going to put it in contemporary terms for you, okay? When we have a wonderful service, we all come up and we pray. And uh, who amongst you has ever come to the altar and received joy or just fulfillment or just you come for 10 or 15 minutes and you just feel like God's done something in your life? Amen. And that's amazing. So in your presence, God, there is a fullness of joy, but there's another dimension where we have not reached. 
Because after we receive joy, after 10 to 15 to 20 minutes at the altar, guess what we do? We leave this house and receive pleasure from other sources. We receive pleasure from media. Pleasure from shopping. Pleasure from working. Well, whatever that pleasure is, I'm not preaching against having fun. That's not what I'm doing. But what I'm saying is, is that the Lord desires us to linger in his presence. Linger in his word. What happened to those church services where young people and older people would get together for an hour or two and just pray? Because at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You know what Brother Roger was doing this morning? He was telling me he's been doing a Bible study for weeks on grace, just his own personal study. He said, oh, God's blowing my mind. God's tying these together, and I'm just so overwhelmed about what God is doing. What, what, what is Brother Roger doing? He's not just doing his 15 minutes at an altar to receive a blessing, to receive, oh, I feel better now. Now I can go back out and do the things I want to do. God loves you, and if you're baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and you're living a good life, you're going to heaven. But could it be that we live below where God desires? After I receive my blessing, I'm going to go and get my entertainment elsewhere. We can spend four to five hours on devices and doing everything else in this world, but the Lord is calling this church to something deeper, to a change in the atmosphere where we don't treat them just like a slot machine. Okay, I've received my joy. Now I can go have fun. I've received my joy. Now I can go play video games. Now I can go watch something on the media and electronics. Now I can go do these things. God's saying, if you would just understand that there is a whole world out there in me that you know nothing of and if you would just find your entertainment from me your pleasures from me remember that young missionary that came from Scotland I can't remember his name I liked him why am I asking you you can't remember what you had for breakfast (laughs) but he came and the Lord showed him a vision And the vision was this. He had a massive library. It was like, I don't know, 10 stories tall. He was in this library, and there was one book opened, and there was thousands and thousands and thousands of books in this library. And the Lord spoke to this young man. He said, in this book is what you know of me. And all these unopened books, this is what you have yet to learn and understand. If we would be one willing to create our own atmosphere of praise, worship, forgiveness, unity. Two, if we would be willing to create an atmosphere where, God, I know that I've received my blessing already from you. I know I feel good right now. We usually stop when we feel good at the altar, don't we? When all the pain is gone, when all the hurt is gone, when all that stuff is gone, we go, okay, I'm good. Don't we? Okay, thank you, Lord. Now I can go entertain myself with what I desire. These are the things I want. This whole world is wrapping up. And I'm just as guilty as everybody else. I'll be looking at this and I'll be looking at that and I'll be going, what about that? And why I should buy that and so on and so forth. And God's going, would you just entertain yourself with my presence? There are things I could show you in the word. There are things I could show you in prayer that you know not of because you won't dive in. But the Lord is beginning to change the atmosphere of this church. I'm telling you, we saw a glimpse of this last night where people just spawned. We we should have shut that down, Pops, because they didn't know any better. You don't praise, just you only praise for about 15 to 20 seconds. That's polite praise. Okay? Don't we don't they know we had a program? But people said, oh, I just, I keep feeling the presence of God. I just want more of Jesus. You know what Joshua did? 
Exodus 33 and 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, and as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again unto the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now Joshua was an up-and-coming general and the next leader of Israel. I just imagine what he should have been doing. Kissing babies, shaking hands. Hey, I'm General Joshua. How you doing? I'm going to be the next leader. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Hey, you want to have manna next Tuesday? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They could eat anything else. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeesh, sorry, dad joke. That was my dad joke today, bro. Um, there, there was Moses in the presence of an almighty God. Power. Joshua wasn't, wasn't in the presence. He wasn't there with Moses. He was outside. But Moses left. But Joshua said, I could be following Moses back into the camp, and that's probably the protocol. But I could just feel a little bit of what Moses felt. Can you imagine lingering in something that's not even the full deal? Could I just linger a little bit in what Sister Crawford has experienced in the Spirit? Could I just linger a little... Has, has the Spirit of the Lord become so normal for us that 10 minutes is good enough? Where is our desire? Not only in the church house, but in your house. See, what happens is this. You create an atmosphere wherever you go. So if you create an atmosphere of carnality, if you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, you can get delivered here at a church and feel joy, but right, you go right back to your house and entertain yourself with it. And it comes right back, and it's a vicious cycle where every single week you got to pray through. But if you create an atmosphere where you say, my house is going to be called a house of prayer, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to linger, and I'm going to get a hold of God, Eli Hernandez tells a story. He said he was, man, he was so folk, he was so singularly focused on the work of God, singularly focused on hearing God's voice. I don't, he wouldn't even turn on the radio, I don't think. I'm not there, just saying. But he said, I just want to be, I want to entertain myself with your presence. And he tells a story of he's got three fruit trees. He, what he did, he passed away. But he had three fruit trees in the back of his yard. And he said, I'm doing work on the fruit trees or whatever. And he says, an angel shows up. And I'm like, what is going on? What's this angel doing here? So he goes over here. And he says, everywhere I went, it followed me. Woke up three days, the angel followed him. Then he went to minister at this particular church. And as soon as he walked in the doors, the angel left his side. And the pastor immediately came up to him a few minutes later. He said, man, an angel just walked in this house five minutes ago. That is where you can go to if you just create the atmosphere in your life. If you just like Joshua say, I am going to linger. And if there's too many people talking after service, go to the prayer room. Because they don't dictate the atmosphere you create, you do. If they won't pray, that's their own problem. If they just sit on the preaching, that's their problem. You don't be a part of that. You just say, God, it's you and me, and I'm going all the way, and I'm not going to stop until I, until I change the atmosphere of my life. And this is, um, I know this is hard preaching, because it goes against the flesh. We are intoxicated with this world. We are intoxicated with the entertainment of this world. And I'm not talking just Hollywood. I'm talking buying and selling and shopping and golf and I mean whatever it is, vacationing. I mean, just pick it. 
Right? We are intoxicated with getting our entertainment and pleasures at the right hand of Babylon. Where God is saying, I'm desiring a church to go deeper in me. Because when you create the atmosphere of praise and when you create the atmosphere of worship and you create the atmosphere of unity and then you begin to linger in his presence, though when you create those two atmospheres, it naturally creates the third atmosphere. When I told you that when you become unified and you dwell in unity, right? That's how they know. That's how they know that you're his disciples by your love one towards another. When the Bible says when you prefer your brother over yourself, guess what happens? It's infectious. This is what happens in the atmosphere. This is so exciting. When you change the atmosphere of your life, it doesn't just affect you. Romans 5 and 19 says this, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Just like Steve Willoughby, when he praised with reckless abandon, it infected the whole congregation. When you come into prayer and you create the atmosphere, or you create the atmosphere of forgiveness in the church or unity in the church or love for your brother in the church, guess what? It's infectious. Young people, when you went to that church last Saturday night, the youth president's wife said, that's infectious. You know what an atmosphere is? If you don't, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> an atmosphere is not something that simply affects you. It doesn't simply just even affect the city of Peterborough. You see, a weather system. What does a weather system affect? It affects subcontinents. It affects entire regions. When we get a snowfall, it's for Ontario and northeastern United States. When you change the atmosphere in your spirit... When you change the atmosphere in this church, it's not just going to affect you and a few other people. There's going to be an apostolic outpouring that this world has never seen. Woo! And I was praying, don't tell anybody at work. I can't show this video at work tomorrow. So I'm telling on myself. The staff left and I, I was listening to a preacher and I just felt this message and I felt waves and waves and waves of it coming. It's just what I thought I thought about monsoon season in India. Guess what happens when the atmosphere changes? Everything in the natural and everything on the earth has to react to what just changed in the atmosphere. Everything ha is, is affected by what has just happened by something up here. So when you change the atmosphere in your spirit and you change the atmosphere in this church, it, 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 it is impossible for it to only affect this church. It's going to affect multitudes and regions. I remember Art Wilson told the story. These two young girls that got the Holy Ghost and they were... I think they got drunk in the Holy Ghost and they were praying for days. Changed the atmosphere. And then they wanted to have a visit. At least, what, how old were they? 10 or 12? 14. And they said, the, the mother said, My daughters want to meet you, Pastor. They have something to tell you. And so they, they met with Brother Art Wilson. Art Wilson sat in his chair and he said, uh, these two 14-year-old girls began to prophesy to me about what God was doing. My soul. It was that Art Wilson that went to the United Nations that gave way to Brother Lee Stone King to speak at the United Nations in front of a hundred and some odd countries, representatives from their countries. 
and he began to preach Jesus. There was a revival in the 1850s in Midwest America. There had been several years of drought. And uh, this is the same Christianity that these people practiced. And the preacher came and they wanted to pray for rain. And so the preacher said, bring your umbrellas. It was a drought for many years and people were losing livestock and it was just an awful, awful, awful time. Bring your umbrellas because God's sending the rain. And by the time they left that tent meeting, there was flooding. Because when the church changes the atmosphere of their lives, it has a direct connection to the atmosphere of their lives. That is what I'm telling you, is that God's trying to change your atmosphere because he's going to change their atmosphere. And it's not just going to affect 20 or 30 in Peterborough. It's going to affect thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And why don't we stand this morning? Acts 17 and 6. This is what it's going to do. But it takes commitment it takes lingering. It takes, I'm not going to blame my life on anybody else anymore. And I think we've all had that scenario in our lives where we choose to blame somebody else for our stuff. But when we begin to change that atmosphere in our lives, the book of Acts tells us the results. This is so amazing to me that a group of unlearned fishermen and farmers. I mean, they, they were like, they made fun of Galileans. And they were afraid and they were jockeying for position before Pentecost and they were unknowing, build their own kingdoms and so on and so forth. And after Pentecost, thousands of people were added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Why? Because they changed the atmosphere in their life. I'm not speaking negative anymore. I'm speaking faith. I'm going to be full of the Holy Ghost. And this is when they come to a city. There are certain people in the city. They are scared out of their minds that these no-name fishermen are coming to town. Isn't that amazing? People with no position scared the people with position. We don't need politicians. We don't need government connections. We just need Jesus. When you get into his government and his ability, he will change the world. And when he found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying. Oh no! The unlearned fishermen are coming to town. No. Because they understood these people bring an atmosphere. Last Saturday night, you guys brought an atmosphere. And it changed the way that service played out. I'm telling you right now, it changed it. And these people went to the rulers and said, oh no, those Christians are coming. And we know what they're like. They they bring an atmosphere that literally turns the world upside down. And that is what the Lord is going to do in this church. And my question to you today is, who wants to change their atmosphere? Who wants to change their atmosphere? Oh God, you're taking us to a place where you're going to turn the world literally upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ and no man's going to get the credit and all the glory goes to you but you're telling this church it's time to change the atmosphere if you're willing to linger if you're willing to go deeper if you're willing to speak faith I want you to come right now I want you to come to this altar and I want you to begin to pray and I want you to begin to commit and I want you to say, Lord, I'm lingering in the presence of God. I'm desiring something greater. I'm desiring something deeper.
because you desire to take your church somewhere. Hallelujah. Hamara mama sotoraba karabasha. Lord, I don't want to be entertained by things in this world because at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Come on, begin to open your mouth. Begin to receive. Oh, hallelujah. Hamako Raba Shatarabasa, Hima Raba Baba Katarabasa. The fruit that is born from unity and the fruit that is born from desire is supernatural harvest. God, that's what I desire, that's what I crave. Oh, Jesus. I said, let God fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, God's changing the atmosphere. Hamarama Korabaha. Come on, let's dig, church. Let's dig. Hamarama Koraba Shatarabaha. Come on, you've been starting something in the last few weeks. Hasharabo Sarababa Ke. We're going to linger in the presence of God. We're going to linger, Lord, in your presence. It can be difficult preaching because it comes right against your flesh. But you need to submit your flesh to the Lord. Say, God, not my will, but thine be done. I want to change the atmosphere of my life. I don't want to speak negative anymore. I'm going to speak faith. Hallelujah.
Come on, it's okay to count the cost. It's okay to count the cost. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's worth it. Everything I've lost and everything I've paid the price for, it's been worth it to live for Jesus. It's been worth, I'm telling you, it's worth it to step out in faith. Oh God, I'm going to serve you. Oh God, I'm going to linger in your presence. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, that's it. Yes, that's it. Yes, that's the atmosphere. That's the atmosphere. That's the atmosphere. Jesus. 